We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three, listen. Welcome to Finances, your home for all things financial, investment, money, and lifestyle. Hosted and curated by the very talented team of certified financial planners and Burke Britain Financial Partners. Core financial planning topics, so some of the cornerstone of financial planning. We're going to talk a little bit about investing. And Ben had an article. I might. We better give a shout out to the. You can go, Ben. Give a shout out to the title, the author, and all that sort of gear. So we better do the right thing, or yep. we'll end up in jail. So Cease and desist letter. I think they call uh, it. Nina Hendy and Stephen Miles from Sydney Morning Herald. And again, this this article, I think, again, is probably pointing out the obvious because of a lot of the conversations we're having and people. I'm sure friends, family, kids, whatever it may be, every, you would have been hearing people talk about it more and more. But the title being young people becoming more motivated to invest. And I think it's all around us and you know, what you deem to be in investment or gambling or whatever you want to call it. I think it's all around us and it's probably one of the most topical things we have and probably one of the main reasons people come in and see us is how do I do this or how do I fix what I've already done? So just talking about, again, today we'll touch on what are the different sorts of investments, the tips and traps, and probably most of the time it's the traps that people get caught out by. So I just sort of just read this very short paragraph that starts it out. Experts warn that investing is not a short-term get-rich-quick scheme, and those entering the market should do so carefully with their eyes wide open or suffer the consequences. Sounds pretty dire, but I suppose from our perspective being, I don't know what you call it, pessimists or just realists, sort of realists somewhere in the middle of pe- pessimism and optimism. We've unfortunately seen where it does all go wrong and I don't know how many clients I've had where you're trying to encourage them to do something with a diversified portfolio and they say, oh no, mum and dad lost money on the share market. I don't want to touch that. But they'll contradict themselves with their next 15 decisions they make. So it's more about just being aware and having knowledge of not just so much what the market is, but how to enter it safely. And whatever that market is, the the market is another poor term that gets thrown around. We talk about it even ourselves, like which market? Is it yeah, the property it? market? Is it the share market? Is it the you know futures market? Is it the what? what is it? Like there's multiple different markets out there. So you know, assessing which market you want to enter and then having a game plan about doing it. And, and sometimes simple is better. I think there is definitely... And we've talked about this in other podcasts and probably overlays with FOMO and all, all sorts of things that people want to the get rich quick scheme. Like that's what people, people sort of just want to hit the jackpot and not have to work another day in their life. And unfortunately for probably 99.9% of people, that is not the case. So again, sometimes it's boring, but boring works. I think that's what we probably preach a lot of the time. Well, I think the problem is because boring is not very sexy and it doesn't catch eyeballs, The stuff that catch eyeballs, and we've talked about this before, is that survivorship bias, is that the loudest person or individual that you'll hear is the person that has succeeded, you know, a very aggressive approach to one particular market or one particular asset class, whether it be property or shares or any asset class. But what you don't hear about is those people that went all in, didn't have a plan and did their nuts. And that's the real issue. And I suppose giving people a stepping stone. So when we talk about what is investing, I was thinking about what what would you say your first ever investment was and how old were you? Probably, oh, good question. I think I might have listed down for the IPO of Medibank Private or something when I was 20, 21, maybe, I think, a couple of thousand dollars. That would be my starting point, but I'd probably be interested in it before that. So for most people comes at different stages. Before that, were you to do that? You probably had to have some savings. Yeah, we, so exactly. Were you, were you a saver, like or? Yeah, I think I always was probably. Again, maybe it's a bias because of the fact that I've been interested in finance for a long time. But mm-hmm. I always make sure that there's there's something there for opportunity, whether that be when you're younger, a holiday, or a, you know whatever it may be. Um, always having something there you can jump on opportunities is pretty important. So well, to get to that point, you've probably got to control your cash flow. And have a bit of an idea of where things are at. And to control your cash flow, you said it, you've got to actually take an interest in your finances. Because I, I was thinking about how you would sort of explain what investing it is and starting at the very the early stages, the progression. And I think my first investment, I was a pretty good save. I like spreadsheets. I always like spreadsheets. And again, maybe that came from having your father as a financial advisor telling me that I should have things under control. But I think Peter set me up with a little managed fund 
And back in the day, I think it was, he said, listen, I'll put $500 in and you put $100 a month in from that point on. And that was really my entry point into investing into what you'd consider to be sort of growth assets or equities. But I think the very starting point, as we talked about in the last podcast, is people getting their house in order so that they understand you know, they've got their cash flow under control. The progression from that is once you've got your cash flow under control, you've got a surplus. Once you've got a surplus, what do you do with that surplus? Do I save it? Do I save it in cash? What am I saving for? Beyond that, and sort of the 21st century now, when I grew up in the late 20th century, there was no micro investment platforms. And I think that may have, did they touch on that in the article? Yeah, yeah so they talk about that as well. And I was, I was going to say, we, the massive benefit to people these days is the options available. Where it's a massive benefit that you can do it in small pieces at a low cost. So back, well, it ages too much, but he's not quite a boomer. But um, close. Uh, you, you know, you might have had to go out and buy into a managed fund with an entry cost, and it had a, a brokerage cost or something. Where now you can literally start out with a few dollars at a time. Well, I think that original investment that I made into a managed fund, it, it must have been that original five hundred and five hundred must have been the minimum contribution. So it's a thousand dollars. So the barrier to entry. You know, required a contribution from my dad. I had some savings. I made that contribution. Today, with the advent of sort of uh, micro investment platforms, the barrier to entry is very, very low, which there's two parts of that. There's that dichotomy of it. That's a great thing. You get entry level. People can enter in at a very low barrier to entry. The negative of that is the fact that people with absolutely no understanding or experience in investing can get their teeth into it and can do pretty much as much as as little as they like. So again, having people being interested in investing, interested in finances early on gives them the best progression from a cash flow surplus to saving money in the bank to micro investments and then the progression from them then begins to tear up to the likes of managed funds and direct shares and property and the like. And I, I think I've had conversations with probably the children of current clients and they're, they're coming out of school or at uni or whatever it may be and they want to start doing something. And, you know, you've got platforms like Spaceship and uh, Raise and Stake, these micro investment platforms where they can, and I, I sort of speak to them about just getting some experience with the market so they can put a dollar a week in there if they want to. And over a period of time, they can see how that reacts in the market, how it can smooth their risk out. They understand it more. So then when they're coming through later on and they're you know, starting to get their first real job or first real income, they're already a step ahead in terms of their comfort understanding of it. So when they're scaling up those installments from a dollar a week to a hundred a week or two hundred a week, they've sort of already got a feel for what will happen. And it doesn't matter if you've got a hundred dollars invested or a hundred thousand, it's still gonna react the same to the market. It's just more about how they know it's set up and what their circumstances are that go around that. So the micro investment platforms are awesome. Like I, I use them still myself with roundups and random little bits. It's like collecting the small chains out of your from your wallet and putting it in a jar that we used to do. It, it's the same concept. So it's like investing the piggy bank into yeah. uh, markets. So market. actually doing yep. something instead of just collecting coins to well, cash in once well, a year, we well, can actually get them to do something. We should point out that we have no financial interest <laughs> in these companies we're talking about. We're conceptually conceptually we, love them. But yeah, uh, conceptually yes. love them. And again. I have the same. I've got the, a raise account and have used it as much for curiosity, yep. but to understand what people out there are doing and the ease with which people at an entry level or even beyond can actually use these kinds of platforms. And it's it'd be remiss of us to ignore them. I mean, this is what people are actually using. And I think people can have it in their armory now as something that can build them to the point where, you know, eventually people get to the point where the scope of investment advice or investing is a bit beyond them. Uh, they either go so deep that it's what they want to do for their career or they need to outsource it. And I think those clients, and you'd know this, those clients that actually come to us with having had some experience with budgeting, cash flow, investing even at a micro level, they're much better placed. They're more informed people and they make better decisions when they're actually coming in and getting advice. And they ask good questions, which is uh, one of the things we love. Definitely. I think with, with the investing part, probably the thing that most people don't consider is why they're doing it too like we need to be goal-based in terms of what we're doing it for now it doesn't mean it has to be sometimes it's not super specific like sometimes it is okay i want to buy a house i need a deposit in three years time okay we can work with that other times it's about giving themselves flexibility in the future to choose about 
the, the level of working capacity they want to have. So they might want to be able to scale out of work early. So that's probably more of a broader goal as much as you could argue it's specific. It's not a fixed dollar amount. It's about building something progressively. So people invest without purpose. I think that's another challenge is then they, they don't know when to stop, when to increase their installments, when to bail out, all those things. So if you haven't got a purpose to what you're actually investing for, you sort of lack the clarity to make decisions around it as well. Or your decisions are based purely on how you feel or, yeah, or how you feel about it. Yeah. 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 Rather than saying it's you know geared to a particular end, you very much driven by emotion, which we said in pretty much every podcast we've done so far, is something that everyone needs to get a handle on. And one of the things we do particularly well, sort of third party removed from our clients, is that we're not emotionally involved with their money. We can be detached and help them make you know, informed decisions about it. Definitely. I suppose, did you want to talk through maybe just the different sorts of investments broadly as well? Do you yeah, want to so- touch on them without digging in too far? We've talked a bit about micro investments, which essentially just means very small pieces of the following investments in, in many ways. So managed funds, which we sort of touched on it. I think managed funds, ETFs are sort of a bit of a crossover between the two there. A lot of people probably Topical on the ETF front has probably been more no shortage of acronym in this world. Is <laughs> Definitely not. So ETFs is exchange traded funds, and similar to managed funds, it's sort of a pooled assets as a bunch of people's money all collated and invested on that investor's behalf. Generally, with a, with a managed fund, you've got a fund manager, so you'll you'll hear lots of names of fund managers, and their job is to actually take people's invested pooled funds actually go and make individual stock selection. And so we own a little piece of that pie and we're not actively making decisions about the, the shares or the assets that are, that are bought or sold. That's done for us. So it's a managed fund and again, exchange traded funds, which of a similar vein, but the difference would be, Ben, that they can be actively traded on the stock exchange. It's, it's pretty much how you actually enter it, which mm. I think people don't necessarily understand. It's actually just more about your method of purchase than anything else with with how you access them as well. So, At the risk of getting derailed too far, I mean, I remember like managed funds, they required back in the day <laughs> manual application. It was a, there was an application form to invest in the managed fund. The evolution of managed funds into ETFs meaning means that uh, that same managed fund that required me to fill out a 10-page application potentially can be traded now on an app yeah and at risk of going down there's there's m funds and there's all sorts of other acronyms that have come into the go mix down the as whole well. so, okay we can cut it out if we go too far i suppose then you've got the fund managers who haven't gone to the etf format but they've gone sort of via the market and via the i don't know how your best way to describe it, via the exchange to be purchased in a more streamlined manner and that's that's probably just more of a tech advances than anything else that you can still enter those managed funds now via an alternative market instead of buying the ETF. So, again, I think when we're getting into that, that level of detail, you can probably even sense by the way we're talking about it, it gets complicated quickly and how, how you're meant to know what you're meant to be purchasing and which is the best way to do it. I've seen so many people get chopped up from transaction costs. So they think, oh, I'll buy $200 a month of these shares and their brokerage costs 20 bucks each month and that's 10% out. And then when they sell it, there's another 10%. So, You've got to make a pretty good return to you're in the money. So again, there's just these little things that you need to be conscious of with that sort of stuff. And this kind of speaks to what we said before about a progression. And I don't know if we could draw this on a whiteboard. It kind of goes cash investments are your first, your micro investments next, probably well, the micro investments, again, they sort of cross over with the managed funds and the ETFs, don't they? They're sort of a, a micro version of those managed funds and the ETFs. And then once we've got appropriate scale, and the ability with enough funds to diversify, people then generally start to diversify into specific stocks. So that's what we call direct equities or shares or stock. You know, they called a number of different things. And this, for those people in Australia, that is you know, owning something like Commonwealth Bank or yep. Wes Farmers, owning that company and having, having an interest in that company. Which means you, you essentially you own a small piece of it. You've got rights to the dividends and income it produces. You control your stake in it to sell it. You've got voting rights if you wish to. You do actually own a little slice of that pie. So I think broadly, people like the connection to it. They like to be able to understand where they're investing. So getting to that scale People want to do it immediately. Do you, think that, do you think that's more or less now? Would you say that you call me a boomer? I'm not quite a boomer, but the boomers, 
historically Love have loved their direct equities. They want to know that they've got they've had a relationship if they've walked into the Commonwealth Bank for forty years of their life, they want to know they've got a slice of that pie. Whereas the younger crew more inclined to say, Well, I don't really care what I'm invested in in terms of direct shares, if they can get some exposure to the market through managed funds or ETFs. Would you say would you agree? Yeah, I think it, I think it's it's definitely less prevalent now for people to want the direct access. Yep. But at the same time, if you go if most of the people who try and run their own race from an investment perspective, what do they do? They go and buy afterpay or they go and buy direct equity. Like they don't go out and buy you know, you get the odd person that does they go and buy an ETF or an index fund or something that's diversified. A lot of them just start playing darts with, with the market and they just start picking them out. And I think the biggest risk, and again, I think we've talked about this a, a couple of times, is in the last couple of years is when most people have actually, that's when there's the biggest uptake in investing for younger people. And that's coincided with the market being on a bit of a recovery tear in the positive direction. Yeah, so people point. are now banking that they go, I'm making 40% a year without any help. I'm doing this fine. This is a piece of, you know, what? You're allowed to swear on this. Piece of piss, yeah. Yep. So, that, so then my biggest fear for those people is when it starts to turn sour and I sort of follow a few pages where people think that they're running their own race and they're doing a better job than the professionals in some regard and the market goes down by 5% and they immediately start to shit the bed mm. because they're not used to that because the market's just been positive, positive, positive pretty much from the bottom of the COVID crash back at the start of last year. So you've now got these investors who are only used to positive returns mm. and they don't know how to encounter and, and most of the time they're all in they've got no safe they've got no cash there to keep rolling yep. they're just fully exposed to the market and when you're fully in there you're just on for the ride you just hold on because you got what are you going to do bail out and sell at a loss yeah. it, they're, they're not going to do that they're just going to keep piling in and guess what you're only going to hear you're only going to hear the person the uh, that survivorship bias that person who managed to pick that right stock that hung in there, that didn't do their nuts, that didn't pull out. You're only going to hear about a very small percentage of those, but they're going to be the loudest of them. Interesting that you talk about the last, well, I had thought about it because every time I have a meeting with a client and we're looking at our portfolios of the last 12, 18 months, they look fantastic, don't they? But what's the thing that we say every time when you look at the last 12 months, you go, it's fantastic, it's great, but we're not going to expect that we're going to do that again next year. And you're coming off a low base, like, Really, it was a big, it was a significant drop in a very short period of time. So I think, you know, when we look at the portfolios, we're pretty transparent about the fact that I like to run it back from inception and look at it from the last eight to 10 years or whatever that period of time is to see the whole road of what they've been through. And, and then what has the, the average, average return been because, over that period? And the average is still great, but it's not, you know, 27% in the last 12 months. That, that's not an annualized thing that you can generally continue to bang out. And that's where people think they can beat the market. The market will beat them pretty hard when, they, when you get too ahead of yourself with that sort of thing. And it's just like anything. You get too confident with it. You don't have the right levers in place to, to pull to give yourself a bit of breathing space and you're going to be in trouble quickly. And people, people have been doing scarily doing things like borrowing to invest without guidance. And I think we're starting to see the banks realize this is a slippery slope. Like we've got people with Property prices running up. They got equity. They pull the equity out. They start investing. They've read. They they did a, listen to a podcast, ironically about uh, a debt, thing from debt with recycling. A, with a oh, that was <laughs> <laughs> and they start trying to. And they start trying. I'm pretty to sure we said don't do it yourself. I think we definitely did. And I think you'll find banks will be pretty hesitant to let you do it yourself too. But again, we've just got. There's just there's just a lot of factors coming together that make me nervous for people that aren't seeking advice actively. Yeah. And when you talk portfolios before, when you say our portfolios, what we're talking about there is, I mean, everything that we're saying that we'd like people to consider that diversification, like most of our portfolios have a combination of pretty much all of what we've spoken about now. So we've got cash, managed funds, ETFs, direct equities. And the last one we hadn't talked about, or we did talk about then was, was property, whether that be direct residential or commercial property or, or, or property held through managed funds, our portfolios of investments have diversification built in. We make sure that we have, would you call it redundancy, or we, had, we have the ability to pull different levers when things go pear-shaped. And that part of the planning, I believe, like unless it's your full-time gig and you're going to spend every waking moment of your day making decisions about your underlying investments, that's when you need advice. You need advice. You need to come and talk to us and hopefully 
you've spent some time getting your cash flow sorted. You've maybe had a little bit of experience at a micro level. Maybe you've had some managed fund experience. Maybe you've dabbled a little bit in direct shares and you come to us when that gets a little bit beyond you. I think maybe just on the property thing, we've probably talked about that again. We, we probably find these themes coming through. People, again, property is tangible. So that's, that's probably the biggest difference with that versus these other items is that if you've got property investment in a physical sense that you can drive past the thing, you can walk in it, you can paint it, you can, you know, it, it's, it's actually physically there. And people are attracted to that naturally. And property has been a very, very good investment for a long period of time. And we still like property a lot, but it's about where you're at, what your needs, what you've got coming up, the stage of your life cycle. So I see a lot of people approaching retirement thinking, oh, I need to buy an investment property to generate mm-hmm. me some passive income. Like I might buy a townhouse and chuck a tenant in there. Yep. And then you look at, you know, and maybe they, maybe that doesn't say, that's not to say that's the wrong thing to do, but what else have you got going on or how much income do you need? What else is on the horizon for you? Do you have other flexibilities, liquid assets, things to lean on if you need to at any point? So I often say it's a great way to build wealth, but it's not necessarily the way to generate passive income. And I think one of the issues, and we spoke about this this morning, another meeting we had, is that people generally have blinkers on just one or two areas of their circumstances. So they go, I need passive income, I need to buy a property, I'll just go and buy a property, rather than thinking about or asking the question about what else is actually going on, like what's going on in the property market, what's going on with interest rates, what's going on with equities, how's my cash flow looking at the moment, what sort of impact will this have, what else is going to be happening with me, what other expenses do I have coming up in the in the coming years. So again, I know we're biased, I know we're probably to our own horn a fair bit, but I think it's important. People should actively seek advice when they're making decisions about their financial circumstances. So we hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're keen to understand more about how financial advice could benefit you, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Burke Britain FP or Google Burke Britain Financial Partners. Check out our client reviews, testimonials, and make a time to meet one of our certified financial planners by clicking book now on our website. Thanks for listening. Any information contained in this podcast is of a general nature only. No account was taken as to the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Therefore, before making any decision, listeners should consider the appropriateness of any information with regard to their particular objective, financial situation, needs, and seek independent advice from a licensed professional specific to their circumstances. All right, hit it. That translates to don't be a moron and act on what some random person says on a podcast. Take personal responsibility, do your homework, ask questions, and speak to an actual human that knows what they're talking about before you do anything. PP Financial Solutions Proprietary Limited Trading with Britain Financial Partners are authorized representatives of AMP Financial Planning Limited AFS license number 232706.